Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. So we started a new section. Yeah, We are still a little bit in our section on discrete term structure models, but we started discussing the calibration of the model. So we already discussed here the choice of the initial condition and the choice of the volatilities, well, to some extent. So what I would like to do now is discuss a little bit correlation. So I will move to discussing the correlation parameters after this little chapter here, after this little excursion. But I would like to discuss instantaneous and terminal correlation. And what is the motivation for this? If you go back to our discussion on the calibration of disruption. This was our recap of the definition of disruption. And it was already here that we observed that the random variable of the swap rate depends on the covariance. Yeah? And you have here the matrix of swaptions which you observe from Ti to Tj. And you have here a matrix of correlations. So from this picture, maybe it would have been intuitive to say, let's calibrate the correlation parameter because this is really an object that depends on correlation. Yeah. Because there are multiple forward rates entering mm -hmm. and I have a nonlinear function on this option. So this should depend on correlation. And indeed, the value of the swaption depends on the correlation, the covariance of these random variables. But then we studied that I can calibrate all the swaption just by choosing the sigma, yeah, because we have this nice one-to-one -one relation. And when I started here, I even made the assumption that the correlation matrix is given and is fixed. So this could mean that the correlation matrix is just equal to one. Yeah? All entries are one. So this means that I have a one factor model. So there is only a single DW driving all forward rates. Yeah, wouldn't this then imply that there is perfect correlation of all these guys? And wouldn't this then imply that this matrix here doesn't even work yeah? because I cannot influence the um, correlation, the covariances of these forward rates. So motivation, a, a linear product that pays just a linear function of the forward rate just depends on the expectation of that forward rate under the TK forward measure. A caplet is a nonlinear function on the forward rate and its value depends on the variance of that forward rate. The swaption is a nonlinear function on a set, say a sum of these forward rates. So question, it should depend on the covariances. Doesn't that imply that it depends on rho ij? So shouldn't we use the rho ij to calibrate the swaptions? However, you can calibrate the swaptions even if you fix rho ij to be equal to one. So even if you have a one factor model, and this may appear a little bit counterintuitive. Okay, why is this possible? Because then all the forward rate would be perfectly uh, correlated. All the forward rate would be almost identical. How can I then calibrate this by choosing the uh, sigma parameter? And to understand this, we have to understand what is the difference between terminal correlation 
and instantaneous correlation. So instantaneous correlation is my parameter rho. And that's also a nice thing that gives us a little bit more um, intuition and then also leads to that we discuss what is correlation actually doing. So consider a one factor model. So a one factor model means that my correlation matrix is um, equal to one. So it means that dwi dwj is just one dt. So it just means that you have a single Brownian motion driving all your processes. So my model is that dli is mu i dt plus sigma i dw1 and dlk is mu k dt plus sigma k dw1. Okay, so this thing that we had in the model, there was in the model the lambda i, so now I have to use a different index, say dl, d u l okay so my l goes from one to one okay so the d u maybe i write d w d w l yeah so my l just goes from one to one yeah so i have a one factor model there is just a single problem motion driving this so the instantaneous correlation so my row parameter is just one, yeah, because the dw1, dw1 is a one dt. So how can I create that the random variables that I observe when the swaption exercises are uncorrelated? Well, the thing is that if you think now in terms of the Euler scheme, what we do is we make time steps in our time little t, say time steps tj1 and a later time step tj2. And on each time step, I have an independent Brownian increment. So we have that two Brownian, whoops, two Brownian increments. They can be independent or they are independent if they are on different time steps. So my delta W being the same Brownian motion, my delta W TJ1 is independent from the delta W TJ2 if J1 is not equal to J2. So I can create more independence by letting the two forward rates move at different times. Yeah? So see, these are the two forward rates. Yeah? So instantaneous correlation. So my parameter rho ij means that they move in synchronicity. But now what you can do is you can say, let's fix the volatility of one forward rate so let only the other one move. And then at some time, let the other one fixed and the other guy moves. And then I stop. Of course, the two realizations are now completely independent. So the row parameter only has an impact if the two move. It tells me, okay, they move in synchronicity, yeah, but the sigma parameter tells me about the amplitude. And by having different amplitudes at different times, I can create independence. So this is what I do. I look at two forward rates. So I have two model parameters. I have a sigma i and a sigma k. And I can ensure that the accumulated variance for both is the same over a certain time, say up to the time when the swaption fixes. So this here is my time 
TI, which corresponds to the fixing. or exercise of the swaption, for example. So I ensure that both accumulated a given variance up to this time, but they accumulate this at different times. So the sigma i is large up to time ti half, and then it drops to zero. The sigma k is zero up to time ti half, and then it drops to a larger value. So what's this larger value? Okay, I have cut this interval here into half, yeah? So the size should be twice as high. So if this here is my uh, sigma star, the size here should be twice as high. Well, the square should have twice the size. So this level here is square root of two times uh, sigma star. Okay, so we can do this and create um, the correlation in the terminal random variables. So the random variables observed at a later time. This is the correlation of random variables. Although the Brownian motion is just a single one, the Brownian motion used for the two ones has perfect correlation. So let's do a numerical experiment. I will do this for two random variables, L5 and L8. Okay, and I will compare now uh, the terminal correlation for different, um, different model variants. So what I will do is I will plot the random vector L5 fixed in T5, L8 fixed in T5. So I will plot this for, say, different, um, different omegas. So as always, you find this numerical experiment here in our repository, so you can play with this later. And um, it's still in the class where we did all the experiments related to our uh, term structure model. So let's have a look. So this is um, our play count for the term structure model. I have commented out all our other experiments. So we are now ended up here. So I have a small experiment, plot the terminal correlations. Let's look into this. Okay, so um, these this guy here will create four different plots for four different model parameters, the um, configurations for four different model configurations, the ones that I had on my slide. And the model configurations are, uh, should you use a constant volatility or a disjoint dislocated volatility function. So if this is false, yeah, I will just use identically sigma functions for two for the two forward rates. And if this is true, uh, then I will do the trick here from my slide um, of moving the accumulated variance to disjoint time intervals. Yeah. So if this is true, I will do it. Uh, if it's false, I will not do it. So the three false guys are my model with the constant functions. And this one here is then that we do the trick. And I will do that for a different number of factors. So a one factor model, so instantaneous correlations is exactly one. And then also a three factor model and a 40 factor model. If the number of factors is not equal to one, I will use a very large decorrelation. So the correlation model is e to the minus five uh, ti minus tj. Yeah. So already after one year distance of the forward rates, yeah, you have an e to the minus five, you have a very low correlation. So this is just because we have this very simple correlation model that the correlation is modeled by a single parameter and e to the minus a ti minus tj. 
So apart from that, my model parameters are as before. I start with initial value of 5%. It's a semi-annual model up to 20 years. Um, if I use a constant volatility, I use 30%. And um, I already explained, if we have not a one-factor model, we have a very strong, uh, so there should be a strong here, strong decorrelation. So the model will have uh, very low correlations between the Brownian drivers driving the individual forward rates. I need to do... Um, a special thing in case this parameter here is true. So in case I would like to create these functions. So I have to extend a little bit our uh, model factory. So if you look here, there is another call to our model factory. And this call allows me to specify the volatility matrix. So let's use, uh, let's have, uh, let's have a look here into this uh, implementation. So it is the same implementation as before. Yeah, we defined the time discretizations, the forward rate curve, the discount curve. But I now pass not a constant volatility parameter. I pass a volatility matrix and I have exchanged a single line. Um, it is the line that creates the volatility model. So there is a volatility model that has just a given matrix. Yeah, so create a volatility model from a given matrix. So I pass here this volatility matrix, my sigma ij. And if you look into the implementation of this, it will just return the sigma ij for the corresponding time index and component index. Okay, so I can pass this matrix. Maybe it's good to see that the first guy here is the simulation time index, and the second guy is the index of the forward rate. So it's actually reversed to what I had on the slide. It is sigma L for the time parameterization, K for the forward rate LK. So I have to pass this matrix into this implementation here. Yeah, let's build this matrix. So I built this matrix here. Um, so this is now the index. This first parameter here is the simulation time discretizations. Yeah, so up to time horizon in time steps. So that many steps I have in the first index. The second index is the choice of my forward rates. So it is how many forward rates do I have in my time discretization. So the second parameter is the specification of the forward rate, the first one of the time. I just fill this matrix with my constant. Yeah? So just fill the matrix with your constant 30%. And then if my Boolean is true, if this parameter is true, I modify the entries for L5 and L8. Well, I have a semi-annual model. Yeah? So the entries for L5 and L8 are the uh, column 10 and column 16 in this matrix. So I will modify forward rate L5, choosing here the 10, and forward rate L8, choosing here the 16. I will modify by shifting volatility from Ti half after for, uh, or before, yeah. Uh, so across this border. So Ti half is, Ti half is actually the time 5.0 half, it's 2.5, but since I have time steps in half years, this is before index five or after index five. So the volatility matrix for L5 gets all the volatility, volatility times square root of two, to the time from T0 to T5, and then it drops to zero. And the volatility 
function for L8 gets all the volatility after time T5, yeah, which is equal to 2.5, and before it drops to zero. So actually here, I'm just constructing this function, which we had here on the script. Yeah? So I'm moving the volatility across this border. This border here is the time Ti half. So then I create this simulation and I just plot a scatter using these two random variables. So you see the random variables, they all fix in time Ti. They fix in time Ti equals five. And then they are for the period five to 5.5 or eight to 8.5. I just create the plot and then we are done. I also calculate a little bit the terminal correlation. So the correlation of these two random variables. And I also calculate or I ask my model, what was the instantaneous correlation that you used? And I print this. So let's run this. As I mentioned, I do this for three configurations. First, constant volatility and just alter the number of factors. Then use a one factor model and alter the volatility functions. So let's run that guy. Okay, and you see our nice result. Yeah, um, a one factor model where all the volatilities are constant will create terminal correlation perfect to one. So that's the picture on the top left now. Okay, so terminal correlation is perfect to one. Whatever you observe in L5 is the value that you observe in L8. Yeah? The two stochastic processes are identically, well, almost. There is this difference in the drift, but we do not see this difference. If you change the number of factors to say three factors, this will create some decorrelation in the rho ij parameter. And you will so observe this correlation being present in the terminal correlation of the random variables. So this is the picture on the upper right now. So the upper right is now my three factor model. Well, volatility is not yet disjoint. Yeah, it's a constant. By the way, it's a normal model. So you see there is decorrelation, but you still see that there is some kind of correlation because there are more points here yeah, than, for example, here. Yeah, there is something like, a, uh, you, see, you, see, you see a dependency structure still. If you increase the number of factors, you make the rank of the correlation matrix larger, yeah, you will create more decorrelation and you can create perfect decorrelation. My claim was I can also do this on a one-factor model if I use our special volatility functions. And this is the picture I have on the bottom right. So you see on the bottom right, this is a one-factor model where we used volatility accumulated at different times. This generates um, independence in the same way, you know, or similar to a model where volatility is identical, but where we have a high factor matrix uh, with full decorrelation. Also remember that for the efficient calculation of the drift, it's um, yeah, preferable to have uh, a low number of factors. Yeah? So if you can create decorrelation by the volatility function, the model is maybe more efficient. So I can alter a few parameters, yeah? So for example, I could alter the model simulated under a different measure. So I can do that under terminal measure. Oh. And we have a similar picture now and similar values.
What happens if we move to a log normal model? So this one is normal. I change the parameter to log normal. Okay, you observe that now you have a little bit of correlation here. And if I now move to spot measure back again, so I have now log normal under spot measure. The old correlation was minus 0 0.9. Now it's plus 0 .08, uh, minus 0 0.09 to plus 0 0.08. So we see some correlation. Where is that correlation coming from? Okay, so you see there's still no correlation here if you use the decorrelated factors. Where is this guy coming from? Well, it's coming from the drift. The two processes still have the drift. And in the drift, you have a term sigma, sigma rho. And if rho is not equal to zero, this term is present in the drift. And uh, the drift will create some uh, correlation. The correlation in the drift is negative if I have terminal measure because the drift is negative. And the correlation will be positive created by the drift if I'm in spot measure because the drift is positive, a positive function of the forward rates. So these are our um, pictures we had. So this here is the one factor model where we have a constant volatility and this here is the one factor model where we now use these special volatility functions and we can create decorrelation in a one factor model. If you use constant volatility functions, but a low number of factors, okay, you see there's still some correlation here in this model, yeah? So there's still this, this dependency structure. So here are the values from the printouts. So the surprising thing is that we can create in a one factor model, we can create terminal decorrelation, decorrelations of the random variables, even if we have perfect correlation in the Pro IJ parameter. Okay. Um, of course, you also can achieve this in a 40 factor model, the decorrelation. We also saw that we have some residual correlation here, which comes from the drift. But we only see this under um, a log normal model because then in the drift, there is the parameter L. Yeah? So the drift becomes larger if L becomes larger. So this is creating the correlation. So you see this effect is not given here under the um, normal model, yeah. Okay, so that was a nice uh, little tour. Here is um, a collection of our um, observations. Yeah, we can achieve perfect decorrelation in a one-factor model. Of course, we can also create perfect decorrelation in a high-factor model, yeah? but not in a low-factor model, and um, the. Instantaneous correlation is independent of the measure that is Gesanov theorem. So while that is the case, the terminal co correlation depends on the measure because there is correlation created from the drift. Also a nice, interesting thing. Huh? So only the infinitesimal parameters, the sigma and the rho are independent of a measure change. The terminal guys, the correlations or variances that we observe are not independent of a measure change. 
for a log normal model the drift generates correlation. Yeah, speaking of correlations, how do we choose the correlation parameter in our model? So I can calibrate all the sigma parameters to swaptions, including the caplets. I can calibrate the initial values to the observed uh, interest rate curve. So what's left? That's actually a really good question. And often the correlation is sometimes just, just chosen to model the historically observed uh, correlation. But uh, there is also um, a family of financial products that you could use. And it is the correlations of the swap rates, you know, the covariances of the swap rates. So just the next level that you could calibrate with correlations. So let's talk a little bit about uh, correlations. So what I mean with correlation is now the parameter rho ij, so the instantaneous correlations in my model. We had the version of the model 109, where each process is driven by its own Brownian motion, and we specified dwi dwj equals rho i j dt. Yeah, so I'm interested now in the parameter rho i j. Recall that we also had this alternative form where the rho i j was actually part of the parameter lambda i k, which was sigma i times f i k, where the rho i j is generated by the scalar product of f i and f j. So what I will discuss with you is how do we actually choose these lambda i k's? Given that we have sigma i, this means how do we choose the f i k's? And you know, how do we then model the rho i j? So just recall my rho i j is defined by dwi dwj divided by dt, yeah, or remove the dt. But we could also move to this alternative representation where we represented the, the dwi by a sum fik duk, where duk are now independent Brownian motions. And F, I, K are the factor loadings that generate the Brownian motion D, W, I. So here it's, here it's K from 1 to M. Yeah? So this is my M factor, M factor model. So if I view the F, I, K as a matrix, then this is an, is an N times M matrix. And we could write in matrix notation that DW, which is a column vector of N entries, these N entries driving each forward rate uh, from uh, L0 to LN minus one. This is equal to F, my N times M matrix, times du, which is now an m vector of the m Brownian motions, independent Brownian increments du, uk. Of course, you can also reduce the number of parameters. Yeah, actually, you see, even in this notation, you have a lot of parameters. It's rho ij of little t. Yeah, it's a matrix that depends on time. Yeah. You could reduce the number of parameters, for example, by specifying that it does not depend on t. 
time. We have a constant correlation matrix for all the times and that the correlation is just a low parametric family. So we use this functional form in our experiment. Forward rates that are further away are more uh, decorrelated. An important thing that we need to discuss is factor um, reduction. We had this already in the motivation, efficient calculation of the drift, um, because the calculation of the drift is order n times m, where m is here the number of independent Brownian drivers we use. So having a low factor model, say for example, five instead of 40, yeah, it's um, a factor of eight performance improvement in the model. And maybe the model is also more robust. Yeah, So we, we do not observe so many uh, financial products. So do we really need so, so many factors? So I would like to reduce the number of factors often something like five factors is uh, sufficient. It depends on which financial product you uh, are valuing, you are analyzing with the model. So the question is, given a correlation matrix, for example, this functional form, how do I actually find the FIK that build my Brownian drivers? How do I find it? And how can I keep the number of factors low? In my implementation, I just specify or okay, take, hey, have a three factor model with a certain functional form or have a 40 factor model with a certain functional form. So how is this done? How do I create the right coefficients FIK, the right factor loadings that generate this correlation matrix? So this is called uh, factor reduction. Actually, what's behind this is um, a principal uh, component uh, analysis. Speaking about um, calibration, yeah, we have already seen that we can calibrate the full swaption matrix only by specifying the volatility functions of the forward rates. So which financial product could we use? We can see later, if we just calculate the um, analytic uh, formula or analytic approximation of a swaption in terms of these um, volatilities that the correlation still enters into this formula. So choosing different correlations will result in different functions that you calibrate for the volatility function. So it's actually not the volatility function, it's actually the covariances that we uh, observe in this analytic dependency of forward rate covariances and uh, swap rate covariances. So you see that you can calculate the covariances, the terminal covariances of the swap rates by calculating the instantaneous covariances of the forward rates which means the terminal correlations of swap rates can be calculated with the instantaneous correlations of the forward rates. So if you now observe a financial product that has a correlation of swap rates inside, this is a financial product that you could use to calibrate the correlations or just view everything together and calibrate swap rate covariances to forward rate covariances. So the dependency is similar to our, our matrix, which we had for those functions. My next section is now the answer to the questions. 
question, how do we choose the parameter f i k here? Yeah, this is an important and interesting uh, technique. Uh, how do we derive f i k from a given correlation matrix? And second step, factor reduction. How do we reduce the number of factors to approximately match this correlation matrix. And let's do that in the next session. Thanks, that was it for today.